we were going to die there. And so we decided that if we were going to die, we were going to fight to try not to die. And the only way to do that was to descend in the dark. I, I was on the National Ski Patrol at Bridger Bowl for that year. I'd been on the ski patrol for quite a number of years, and my winter, my winters were and are often spent skiing. So that was one of my big reasons for going there was that powder mountain. And I was also in the outdoor club, which is totally related, did a lot of backpack and went to Glacier and Yellowstone and a, and a bunch of other wilderness areas uh, every time I had a chance to go. So, <clears throat> and I went out even early uh, to Montana State. I went out about a month and a half early so I could buy a backpack uh, as much as I wanted to. So and that was great. And I was in a theater company. So I auditioned for and I got into this national touring company in American Sign Language. Um, which I hadn't, I didn't know how to speak. I learned as I was there. Yeah. And that plays into what happened also, or at least after. So I'm from, I'm from the Boston area, and I, I didn't want to go home for spring break. We had a family issue going on. My sister had vanished when I was a kid. She ran away. I was 14, broke my family. I, I, I took off to Montana. So come spring break, I, I just didn't want to go home. So I went down to the outdoor club, and I was trying to find something to do that was adventurous. And some guy had posted up this poster on the bulletin board and said that he was doing this 10-day snow caving, ice climbing trip to British Columbia and Alberta. And I thought, oh, that sounds great. So I called him on the That's phone awesome. and we, we, we met up and we went out for coffee and then we did this little backpacking weekend and we figured out that we had complementary skills and he trusted me and I trusted him and off we went. So come spring break, uh, I, should, I should add that he had just completed his uh, certification for ice climbing and I had never ice climbed. Mm -hmm. I've been rock climbing and mountaineering stuff, but not on ice. But winter's my thing, or it was anyway. So <laughs> off we went. We did this uh, maybe eight days of snow caving, which involved skiing into the back country and you know seventy pound packs and up to this mountain called Mount Assiniboine in the in the deep, deep wilderness. And at the time, British Columbia and Alberta they had like one point seven people per square mile, and most of those lived in cities. So this is like seriously in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. And it was great. We learned a lot and we trusted each other. We had some adventures, had some problems. And, and then we skied out. And the ice climb that was on the, the Icefields Parkway north of Banff. And it's a famous climb called Lower Weeping Wall. People from all over the world come to climb mm. this particular ice wall. And it's pretty close to the highway, to the parkway. And so we parked across the street next to the Saskatchewan River and we walked in with our gear. But Tim had all brand new gear. Tim was from a well-off family, and he had everything that he needed, including the new car that we yeah. were driving up in. I didn't have all the gear that I needed, so I borrowed most of it, or I rented what I could, and I came up short. I came up with a, an ice axe, uh, pardon me, a hammer, which is about this big, and an axe, which is about, you know, out of the camera frame there, but bigger. And that yeah. choice, I talked Tim into letting me climb that way. He was opposed to it initially, but I was full of young vigor and bravado, and, and that proved to be our undoing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I can do this. I am immortal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so what that meant was, is that the a hammer, the, pardon me, the axe, you can set the axe in the ice. And if you've ever seen ice climbing videos, you might have seen them let go of the handle and hang on a strap. So you can you can set that axe and you can relax and the strap is it's tightly strapped to your wrist so it's not going to fall off but but the physics of it is once you put that axe in when you dangle the physics holds the axe to the ice and that means you can relax the muscles in your forearm and but the hammer doesn't have that kind of setup the hammer is really used for chipping ice and putting screws in and taking screws out um, and its strap is on the bottom, so I had a strap on my wrist, but when I set it, and there was no pick on the bottom of the hammer either. So I had to hang on to this thing the whole time, and which meant that my forearm burned out. And actually, I ended up switching my, you know, partway up, I was in a position I could switch the axe. And my, so that meant both forearms were burned out. And also, on the swing, if you imagine with the swing of the, of the, of the hammer, it's, a, it, it's shorter by, you know, significant amount of distance, a foot. A foot over 500 foot climb yeah. each swing so all of that amounted to us slowing down uh, to a crawl coming up this ice face 
to the point where just before, well, sometime after noon, we began to realize that we were in serious trouble uh, because you can't just turn around and go down like a backpacking trail. You've got to go up yeah. the ice and down the way that the, the route is. That's why it's a route. And we knew we were in deadly trouble. So by the time we got up to the top of the climb, the sun had set as we sat there and the temperature dropped about 30 degrees. And, and as we sat there, the last team walked out and he's like, one of the guys is raising his arms like, what are you guys doing up there? So this is a day climb. Nobody brought extra food. Nobody brought, you know, sleeping bags or stoves or it was a day climb and it was should have been for us so the temperature dropped about 30 degrees and we knew this was coming and uh, we immediately went into hypothermia and i mean i mean like the like a snap of the fingers the temperature dropped our bodies began to shiver violently shiver like every muscle in my face all over my fingers and my hands and my legs everything was pulsating on its oh own it's like uh, kind of like that and um, uh, on the ski patrol, I'd just been trained up knowing that um, we had a 50 below day on the mountain. And so we'd just gone through all the information. And I knew that this would lead to death. And Tim, being no dummy, he knew that too. So we, we were in a desperate situation. And we talked about spending the night there, kind of cuddled up together against the rock face uh pardon me the ice face yeah but but we didn't have, we weren't warm enough we were going to die if we knew we knew we were going to die there and so we decided that if we were going to die we were going to fight to try not to die and the only way to do that was to descend in the dark and this is a three pitch climb so we had to traverse and repel and traverse and repel and traverse and repel in the dark on ice, sometimes on rock. It was, the thing about climbing is, is that it's it's a hyper-focus. One of the, why I liked climbing when I was younger, it's why I like a lot of sports, is that it requires me to be 100% attention to exactly what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And I, and I love that edge. I, I'm, a, I'm a mountain biker, I'm a skier, I'm a sailor, and I like, I like the edge, but I like this side of control. And that side of control means hyper focus, and climbing is a hyper focus thing. So I, yeah, we had we both had this fear rise up inside of us. You can imagine, uh, and so we had to concentrate to hold our fear in in check because panic will kill you, and make this traverse. Now I could tell you about the the whole night of, of being out there and how hypothermia advanced and and the mistakes we made. Um, but I'm going to cut to the chase here because I don't want to run out of time. So yeah. sometime after midnight, and I don't know what time it was. I, I, I still don't wear a watch. Um, we were on this ledge, and it was about the size of probably your someone's kitchen table, twice the size of someone's kitchen table. And in the mountain, in the granite were, were pins that were drilled and epoxied in with rings and carabiners and straps and carabiners. And so Tim was to my left and I was to his right and we're standing on this ledge and, it, and it's on the rock. And it's the first time all night that we're not going to fall. We're now securely yeah. strapped. And by this point in the night, my hypothermia was very advanced. My feet had gone from feeling like on fire to not feeling anything. My, and my hands, and oh. I, still have, I still have all my digits. I didn't lose anything, but I could have damage everywhere. And so I didn't get third degree, I got second degree, and which is great. I'm super thrilled that I didn't lose my toes or my fingers or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because anyway, um, hypothermia continued to advance. And I got to this point where I was warm because one of the things that happens with hypothermia is that you have this, it felt like I could all of the heat from my legs and my arms rushed to my core and I and I began to get hot and this is a, a there's a reason for this a physiological reason I don't recall what it is it's a common experience people who are often found naked hyper, or without their shirts on when when they die from exposure so I got hot and I unzipped my coat and I knew better okay I, I, I knew better but my cold steals reason it, it causes confusion and it takes away um, smarts. And so I unzipped my coat and, and as I, I did that, I, I had enough of me left to recognize that I was hastening my own death 
by doing this and that a, a peace settled on me when that happened. I, I realized that I, I couldn't, oh, I should say why we couldn't go down. We were stuck there. So I, I, I we were stuck yeah. in this position. We couldn't move. I had the rope. Um, I had tied it off to my harness and I take the other end and throw it out around this corner, um, this craggy corner. And as soon as I pulled it, it jammed way up in the dark around the corner, up this rock, you know, that I, and, and the tighter, the more I pulled it, the tighter the jam came, became. A, and so we couldn't go up because we didn't have a rope and yeah. we were wearing crampons, not climbing shoes because it was off the ice and we couldn't go down as a hundred, 150 foot drop. So we were, we were stuck and we knew that we were going to die there, which was a, 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 a crazy thing when, when death comes at you slowly and you, and you know that it's oh, inevitable. Man, yeah. um, it's humbling. Uh, but, but when I unzipped my coat, this piece fell on me and I knew that I was going to die and I accepted it. I surrendered. And I started thinking about God. I started thinking about my family and that they were going to lose another kid. And it was going to be this international incident because, you know, news and, uh, but I mm -hmm. couldn't do anything about it. So I accepted it. And then I began to fall asleep. I'd fall asleep. I collapsed to the rock, smacked my head. Was, and sleep was like a drop of a curtain, but, you know, ba boom, I'm asleep. And then I wake up back, back up and pull the rope again, stand up, pull it. And then I stood up this last time and, and, and I stood up and, and my whole peripheral vision got black and I, I, it's called tunnel vision. It's the last stage of hyperthermia. You fall asleep, you get this tunnel vision, you fall asleep, you die. And so this tunnel vision came closing very rapidly because my, my brain was freezing. When I, my eyeballs, my eyeballs were freezing. My lips were freezing. I, I can't explain it to you how, oh how deep yeah. the cold can penetrate and, um, the tears, you know, my tears, my tears, the water in my eyes. So this tunnel vision was collapsing on me and I was confused about it, didn't know what was going on. I had never seen this, such a thing before. And I thought I was maybe falling asleep again. And then it went to black and I didn't fall asleep. I woke up and, and by which I mean, all of my pain went away. And I didn't, I didn't understand where the mountain had gone or where I was. I was somehow the same, but also different. I felt like I felt like I was a shade, like I was a you know like a a, a shadow. But I had a yeah. level of consciousness, and in, and in front of me, uh, I had a, a vision. Uh, I could see a great darkness. But the funny thing was, it wasn't like being in a dark room where you close the door and all the lights are out. You can't. See. I could see in the yeah. dark, and way far in the distance in the dark. Uh, a single star appeared and, and overhead that night, there was a billion stars. I can't, if you've never been that far north where there's no light pollution at all oh. on a black night, it's just amazingly beautiful. All these colors and you see the galaxy and it's just amazing. And it was like a one of those stars suddenly appeared in the far distance and and it rushed toward me. And as it rushed toward me, it filled my my view, my vision. And as it came toward me, I was yeah. confused. I was like, what's going on here? Uh, it communicated to me telepathically and, and it wasn't in language. There was, there's no language here. It communicated to me, I'm taking you. And I thought, I'm not going anywhere. I don't know what's going on, but I'm staying right where I am. So I kind of put up my willpower wall, which turned out to be like made of candy glass and, and this <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm, I am so weak and it, it yeah, took me yeah. and, and it enfolded me inside itself and it carried me off. And when I was inside itself, there was a severing that took place. I, I was, I was no longer attached to the world or my human body. And I transformed, I became a, a, a being of light. And my story is really long. I was dead for a long enough for... Uh, a lo lots of things to happen. I'm going to speed through a bunch of stuff. The superposition plays a, a role in this, and so does paradox and metaphor. So everything I say is metaphor. But in terms of superposition, I was I was both inside this angelic energy, call it whatever you want to. It's so much more powerful than any language can uh, I can create. But it was it was pumping comfort into me. 
and showing me its intelligence. And its intelligence was vaster than the universe. And I could see, I could sense, I could understand that it was somehow a, a reduction of its whole self for me. And it was also this infinite, eternal self that was inconceivable to me, even in this state. But I knew that these two things were going on. And I was superpositioned too. I was outside, I'm traveling inside of this entity, back up the course it had come. Yeah. But I'm also outside of it with like an eye of God seeing this happen. But when I'm inside of it, looking at it, I can't see my other self, but I can see both inside me at the same time. I, I can see from both points of view. It's, so I had two points of view. It, it carries me back up the, the way it came and then it unfolded itself or I popped out of it or something like that. I'm not, still don't know. Um, but I, I became an orb of energy. I became an orb of consciousness. My size expanded. I know I had no molecules. Uh, I had no, no, um, electromagnetic energy. Uh, this is a place, place yeah. of non-being. There's nothing there that re resembles anything here. And it was a vast, empty darkness in which I could see that, that extended in every direction. I could see in every direction, you know, 10,000 eyes and way yeah. far in the furthest distance there was a darkness that I couldn't see into and the but I knew myself I understood that this is who I'd always been I had a the highest level of contentment I've, I've ever had and I recognized that this was my eternal nature and that I'd never really been Peter Peter was a temporary place and as I had this contentment and this un self understanding the the darkness uh, out of the deepest darkness an illumination appeared and came toward me and this illumination was the like a waterfall of light ginormous in comparison to me and i was huge and it and so there's this waterfall of light and it, it's also uh, two things at once it's it's one and many it's it's white pure light uh, but this is a metaphor too we're not talking about photons here but that's yeah. kind of the way i talk about it and it was and it was all of the colors in the electromagnetic spectrum and more as, as if i could see infrared and ultraviolet and all of the frequencies every single color and there was a bazillion of them and they're all flowing like and they look like iridescent iridescent fish scales sort of and they weren't switching from one to the other, light to f one yeah, to yeah. many. They were both at the same time. And then uh, it c called to me, showed itself to me. I desired it. And with thought, I moved toward it, rushed toward it, and I touched it with my being. And as I touched it with my being, it flowed inside of me and then surrounded me and expanded me. And all of these things happened at once timelessness it's very hard to talk about I, I talk about it in a sequence but this there was no sequence for me yeah so I, I went through a judgment but the judgment I wasn't being judged I judged myself it was like this light showed me my just previous human life in totality and that no part of me even the parts of me that I had hidden from myself, let alone all the parts of me I hid from everybody else, you know? Um, yeah. Everything was illuminated. And I was completely and utterly seen and known from the moment of my human birth to the moment of my death, and there was nothing about me that was unknown. And it was a, a, a burning, fire, radiant love that then took me through wow. a, a sequence of all of the pain that I gave everybody in my life from their interior point of view i was i was them experiencing the emotions and the chemical reactions and all this stuff their thoughts as i was also my human self go uh, as i gave them all this pain so i was me previous me in my body with all of my thoughts and emotions and the reasons i wanted to really hurt them and the yeah in the other person suffering all the like shock and the anger and the and 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 I judged myself uh, as guilty, as shameful, not because, not because I was being, you know, told I was wrong, but because the immense amount of love that was unconditional and infinite in comparison yeah. to my crudeness, my brokenness was showed me myself. And 
this love that was looking at me was also messaging me mercy, welcome, love. I, I've known you the whole time and I've loved you every moment. Never was a moment that I did wasn't in love with you, no matter what you did. Yeah. It's like a you know the the best parent who loves the kid no matter what, and mm -hmm. they might not like what they do, but they love the kid, love your kid, yeah. and and it showed me my brokenness. It showed me my wholeness. It showed me the brokenness of all humanity. It showed me the equality of our human brokenness in comparison to this infinity. Which, which forever changed my perspective, my perspective of what it is to be a human and be in relationship with others. This after, of course. So, all I needed to do is accept this tidal wave of love. There's just like the tsunami of light, and when I say a tsunami, okay. I don't mean just like a ten foot or a hundred foot, or it's like a like a thousand mile high flow of 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 love and i was just this tiny little stick on the beach and it just yeah. overcame me welcomed me and and um turns out that i couldn't bring all that stuff with me i couldn't bring my i couldn't bring the pain that i gave away all the pain i gave away attached to me and i couldn't i couldn't bring it in all i had to do was accept what already was who I already was, who, div who the divine already is. And I got to say this at this point, there was no religion here. There was no gender, no religion, yeah. no concepts, no ideas. But as it infilled me, it, 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 it showed me this, the unity of truth, love, knowledge, beauty, joy, understanding, awe, paradise, bliss, uh, adoration, wow. love, acceptance, healing, wholeness, wellness, and I expanded like a balloon. And as I expanded, I, I got to this point where there was so much of this, these many things, which were one thing there. We talk about them separate here. Truth is different than, than beauty here, but not there. Uh, and so I get to yeah, this yeah. point where, where I'm so infilled with this that I felt like one more drop and I would have been destroyed and fallen back into yeah. my my into the divine itself and it was also telling me you i create you i make you and and then it showed me my like a highest self and i was like a, a yeah. singular photon superpositioned with a field of photons and this field of photons was one light but it was a bazillion photons all in motion all intelligent all separate all one and i i was both that and not that i was not that in so much that i was somehow limited a limited form of it created and and being called into being in the now then i saw a sort of a lower self of me and i was this lower self also at the same time and this lower self of me was living all these other lives i had all i saw all of these other lives that i had lived or was living because in timelessness there was no past or future it's all now so i'm in all of these lives simultaneously and i have this extraordinary long long life everlasting life as a as a soul as a consciousness and i i got to experience two of those and then i was sort of reduced back down again and i said am I dead? And the voice says, yes, you're dead. And I say, yeah. well, I can't die now because of my parents. They're going to lose another kid. I get swept across the belly of this, this womb, this womb of, of, of the divine being, which is the, like the darkness I'm in is the divine being itself. And it's also illuminated. And I got to see yeah. our universe in live time. I got to look back I, I, could, I could see that the, out of the, this impenetrable darkness, this light was flowing and our universe was being formed in the now. And that it was the, the light itself was sort of weaving itself into matter. And this matter spread across all of the universe that I could see, a, a billion galaxies. And I was in a dark space between them. So I had this, this long view. And, and as I looked at this, 
origin of our universe. Other universes were yeah. coming out of this light, universe after universe after universe. And then the voice inside me, and still, because most of me is still in, in the divine being, despite this little part that's looking at our, yeah. our universe, all of this, the darkness, all of these universes, our universe, the, the, the space that I'm in, all of it combines in saying, uh, I am love. I, my love is all of this and nothing exists except for my love. I, I, am, I am love itself and my love is for you. I, and, I've, and I felt this, that all of the, this infinite love was aimed at me in this way that now completely transformed my life. And that all the entire universe is made of this love. And then my vision was brought back to Earth and Earth was like this live time hologram. And I could see all human beings all at once. And there was darkness, night, and day, and everybody's there. Um, and inside of everybody, there's this light I can see. And it's uh, like, like a golden fleck of, like a little tiny fleck of gold. And it's, and it's brilliant inside of everybody. But there's this fog, and this fog is bigger than the planet, and nobody can see through it. I mean, they can see each other. But the fog prevents everybody from seeing the, the very core of their being, which is the same as, uh, as the divine. And this voice says to me, in the way that I love you now, I have always loved you. And because of my love, nothing is ever lost. No one is ever lost. All come back to me because I am all things. And I, I, the love was, well, transformative. And then... Yeah. I saw my parents' faces, and I saw my parents living their lives from that point on without me, and I saw them simultaneously living their lives with me from that point on. And then I could, I could see their deaths, and I could see that they were coming to where I was. And so the voice said, it's time for you to come home, but here's your choice. You can go back. And you can stay here, but either way, they're coming here, and it's going to be over in a, in, a, in a wink of an eye. The the length of my human life was snap of the fingers, and theirs too. But I could see inside of time, and I could see the suffering that they were going to have to endure. And so I said, well, do I have to stay here? And if and the voice said, no, you don't have to stay here. I said, well, if I if I go back to help my parents just by being there, not like, you know, painting the house and, and uh, you know, cleaning the kitchen, yeah. which I would do anyway, but just by yeah. being alive. Um, the voice said, yeah, you can come back here to this paradise and this beauty. And like, yeah, you come back here. It's your time to come home, but you can do what you want, your choice. So I say, well, if I can come back here, then I choose to live my life. And the voice says, you won't live your life and throws me out. And as I go out, I get compressed back down into a, uh, you know, I go back into this this more condensed light being form, kind of look like a human. Yeah. And and as I'm inside this angelic being again, I, I get to see back into, I get to look back into the darkness and I can see the darkness where the darkness begins. And out of this darkness, this heaven, this light beam is going by me, us. And and, and it's, and so I, I look and, and then there are like a million doorways and in the middle of it is this light beam. and and all the lights kind of spreading out to the outer edges you know like petals of a flower like and much illumination in the middle and the voice which is still with me and it's still connected to the to the divine itself it says to me choose a life choose light and so i i want the light because that's all i really want and but i also think to myself I've got to be a total human being. How can anybody, if, if, if I, I knew that I was coming back with, uh, as a carrier of light, and, but yeah. I figured how, how, pe how are people going to approach me uh, if I'm some kind of, you know, illuminated being, I grew up in a blue collar city outside of Boston, a lot of factory workers, you know, the, yeah. and, and so I, so it's like, how can I relate to these people? Um, if I'm not like them. So. I choose this life and, and immediately this door opens and I go through it and it's, it's not in the beam itself. It's off to the side, but pretty close because I still want the light. And I travel down this tunnel and in this tunnel are 10,000 doorways and they're all choices. And all of these choices lead to all these other tunnels. They're all like, they're all probabilities of lives I could live. Yeah. So I get to the end of this tunnel 
and um, now I'm I'm much more dense and there's this I can see I'm, I can see a body hanging on a cliff I can see another body shaking it I don't know who they are or what's going on and then I'm, I'm kind of like stabbed inside the chest of one and and shoved inside and I'm now I'm I'm I felt like I was being put in a sarcophagus and and I look up and there's a there's like a little like a hole I can still see through and and I can see back and then it just closes and now I'm stuck inside this thing and I'm so I'm 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 a soul inside a dead body and then in my brain and I feel like my brain boots back up and it's sort of like I don't know if you ever had a tube radio you ever see a tube radio from like the 1920s you turn it on it takes like three or five minutes for the everything to kind of warm up and, yeah uh, it was like that my brain kind of slowly came on and I, I my hearing came back and my feeling came back and I was being jostled and I was hearing sounds and screaming and, and I opened my eyes and there was my partner, my climbing partner, Tim, and he's looking at me screaming, don't die, don't die, don't die, don't die. And, and then he sees my eyes open. He's like, you, you were dead, you were dead. And he pulls me up and, and I, I'm a completely different person now. I'm in a body, but I, I don't know who I am or who he is or where we are, but I know that I'm not this thing. I know that I'm now exiled yeah. in this world. And eventually I kind of come back to myself I pull on the rope under Tim's instruction. We descend. We treat uh, for hypothermia because we it's, the car's right across the street. So we set up the tent and we self-treat. And um, and then from then on, I was an entirely different person. I told nobody for 20 years. Oh, it, it was immediate because I, I the world I'm to sure. me was like a celluloid and black and white yeah. and flickering and and but through it penetrating it's like being it's like looking at the if in an old film projector you can see the light if you look right at the lens where the light's pouring out it's blinding you can't look at it and you can hear the yeah. click 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 of the, of the of the film running through it the world had this click 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 going to it it was it was it, could, it was fragile but the light was everywhere i had oh my gosh. no language to describe what i was seeing but i i knew enough to know that nobody else was seeing what i was seeing and which is the reason I kept my mouth shut for so long. Well, all of my relationships, every the, so I, I left on this theater tour within a couple of weeks and everybody yeah. in the troupe was treating me the same way that they were treating me before, but I was an entirely different person. I sounded the same. Um, I looked the same. So immediately this, these next six weeks allowed me to self isolate. So I took myself out of the van and I sat in the back of the pickup truck with my sleeping bag because this is Montana and, you know, we're doing this 14 stage tour. But I spent my entire day meditating, um, but just being alone, trying to figure out what had happened to me. I became, I fell in love with everybody. I guess the biggest thing that the most immediate thing was, is that I, I, I loved everybody. And not just like buddy, buddy love. I was falling in love with people. Everybody I met, I fell in love with, with uh, even the people in the in the theater troupe who didn't like me. I was a long hair hippie, right? And this is Montana in the '80s, um, and, and they were pretty pretty conservative, and I was not. Um, um, and and so they didn't like my clothes. They didn't like my long hair. Um, I couldn't help but treat them with love, even so. And that was baffling to most people. Um, my behavior became not submissive, but courageously caring, I guess. My parents, when I finally got back to Boston, um, I hitchhiked back across the States and my, my behavior was, I, I became more compassionate. My parents told me cause I didn't tell them either. But also, I became much yeah. more eccentric. So my, my, my great example of this, how much I had changed, was when I went back to UMass, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I graduated. At, at graduation, I, I so cared little about all things humans had created that instead of sitting in my seat, I, had, I wore a straw hat. And I convinced somebody to play frisbee with me in the back of the hall for the entire graduation. We threw disc in the back. Oh, I love that. I changed career paths. I was going to go into architecture for grad school. I, I ended up as a minister, but only because I needed a way to earn a living while I was trying to figure out what had happened to me. So I went to divinity school, went to Yale, studied mysticism. I got talked into being a minister, stayed with it for a long time. Uh, and my my siblings my friends 
I became pretty isolated. I intentionally stayed by myself because I needed time to figure out what had happened to me. I became a known eccentric, I guess. Well, it made me, it made me, it gave me suicidality. I wanted to die every day. Mm. Uh, I was living in this darkness. I felt like I was in exile. I was alone. Nobody could understand me. I couldn't tell anybody because I didn't want to be thought insane. Um, but yeah. lucky, luckily for me, I, uh, in high school, I went to a Catholic high school, all bro, all guys, and it, near a monastery outside of Boston where they were developing what now is called centering prayer. And my religion teacher, my senior year, went off into this monastery and learned meditation. And so I'd already been a meditator. Yeah. I used I used meditation, sort of a zazen, quieting mind, uh, breath and word thing, um, which I still practice, practice it this morning. Um, that, and I, I came back so different. I found Kriya Yoga, through uh, the autobiography mm. of a yogi and the yoga sutras. And I was in a mime class. I, I studied, I was in this theater group as a mime. And my That's new cool. teacher, it was fun. Um, my new teacher was in Marcel Marceau's school. And Marcel Marceau taught Hatha yoga. And so all of our classes began with Hatha. And I began to experience in this, this practice, this energy in me. And one day, uh, the teacher showed us how to access this energy. And then um, once that, once I found that it was there, and I was the only one in the class who, who like could do, could feel it. Um, I began yeah. to recognize that that was part of who I was, begin to cultivate that. So with the centering prayer practice, I learned to self empty. And with the Kriya practice, I learned to activate um, my subtle body. And I didn't know that it was going to work. Um, I was a Catholic kid, Orthodox kid out of Boston, no exposure to the East to speak of. But it seemed like the teachers that I encountered in my reading knew that this could work. And so I took a trust in it and I pursued it for the whole of my life. I still practice. Uh, it gave me stability in the world and that's really what happened I, I tried to figure out a way to integrate myself in the world but I couldn't because because it's alien yeah. to me I found that the only place I could really integrate back into was back to where I had come from back into the oneness of being and the more I empty myself the the larger capacity I create inside of myself of emptiness the easier it is to for me to to back foot so and in, in, in maybe you know when and when you when you're in a martial art dojo you, you you can sometimes put your foot on your back weight your back weight you know on your back foot so your front foot's kind of loose yeah. um that's what i did with my spirituality i found that if if i drive myself to the interior and my depression kind of drove me like i was so alone i needed this one thing i found a way to integrate by emptying myself well, the thing about a near-death experience is it happens when you have no brain. And so the memory isn't, wasn't lodged inside my brain. My task is, with my head was to understand what was lodged inside my soul. Because this, this higher mm. self of me, this consciousness that comes to top down, was uh, I needed to yeah. figure out a way to integrate that, but also to understand it. And so I became a minister. And I did that in order to earn a living and continue my meditation practices and studies. But there was this huge embezzlement in the church that I was in. And there was a, the people who were in charge of the embezzlement had embezzled money previously in the previous decade. And we're talking millions of dollars. And um, the mm -hmm. money, by the time I arrived there as the minister, they were protecting the current embezzler who didn't know that they had embezzled. Um, we didn't find out all this until much later. But the the... Because I am not controllable, because I didn't really yeah. work for the peep for the for the church, because I have this interior thing, and 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 not a believer. I need to say that I am not a believer, uh, so I didn't buy into any of that. Um, I worked with it, but I I became a liability for them. And the more I, because I knew that there was a problem, and the more I dug, the worse uh, they attacked me. They tried to ruin me financially, professionally, publicly. And these were powerful executive kind of people, C-suite. CIA kind of people like uh, I live in a resort. This is a resort town in Maine where the wealthy yeah. come and powerful. So in the end, we caught the uh, the embezzler and these power people who had spread their poison through the entire town. 
um, were depowered and shamed and and left the church, and they tried to defrock me. They tried to ru- like seriously ruin me, and in a public way. Yeah. And so in the end, when that was all over, um, and it lasted a long time, like seven years of this. And I endured because I was meditating and I endured because I was practicing my yoga and, and driving myself deeper and deeper. The more pain I had in the world, the deeper I drive myself into this place of quietude. And in the end, uh, one Sunday morning, I was, after it was all over and we'd gone to, we prosecuted, it was a, there was a court case, it was a big deal. And the deacons gathered one Sunday morning. I walked in the church, and uh, they're not supposed to gather by bylaw. And I don't know if you know this about bylaws. The reason why they're by laws is because states where they're incorporated, where, where the where the nonprofit exists, are the bylaws are enforced by law. You can't you, you, when you don't abide the bylaws of a nonprofit, you're breaking the law, not the bylaws of the of the church oh, or the nonprofit. Yeah. So the by bylaws, the deacons were never supposed to meet without the minister. And I walk in the church into like their meeting. I'm like, and now all, like these, these guys, they were trying to ruin me for seven years. And now what's going on? Yeah, even? Yeah. So this guy came up to me, this woman came up to me as I was in the pulpit. And she said, you, we're so grateful for what you did. We had no idea what was going on. Uh, she had, the guys, these people had turned the whole church against me and a lot of the town. And you must have had a lot of faith to yeah. put up with us. And I thought to myself, I don't have any faith at all. I'm not a believer. I don't have any faith at all. And now I feel like they trust me. So I decided to ca- throw out my, my sermon for the morning and tell them the truth. And so from the pulpit, I told them why I was able to do what I did for them. Um, even while they were using me as their whipping boy. And and I, it was kind of a spontaneous thing, but then... That next week, five people in my town came up to me. I thought I was alone for 20 years. And I didn't want to be thought insane. Yeah. I had a thing that happened to me when I was younger where, I, where people wanted to commit me because I did. I told yeah. one person and they thought I was nuts. So, you know, you learn to keep your mouth shut. And, and then I discovered that there were other people in my town. And one of them I had known since college. And, and, and it yeah. turns out that they were hiding too. And... From that point on, uh, I began to slowly take off my mask. I wore a mask for all those years. I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't hide who I was. It was spilling out all over the place in my marriage, in my kids, in all my relationships. It was just like because I don't. Anything that humans create, anything that's conceptualized in the human mind, does not exist on the other side. There's no. There's no politics, there's no finance, there's no religion, there's no technology. None of that exists it, because it's here. And so my investment in all of that is negligible. I, like, I love technology, okay? I use it all the time, I'm using it right now. But I know that it's yeah. temporal. I'm not attached to it because I'm attached to this other side. So it was coming out of me everywhere I went, only now, I could take my mask off and just be who I actually am. And that had some price that I had to pay with that. Um, but now I'm trying to encourage everybody to come out of the closet. Yeah, some guy named Pim von Lommel, he's a doctor from Europe. In one of his studies, okay. he's a near-death researcher. In one of his studies, he figured it was something like 10 to 20 million Americans today. It's a lot. Yeah. Well, she knew. I she's the one, she's the one I, I told, and um, she's yeah. I told a couple other people too. But uh, she she understood me over all the years. She came to understand um, who I am. But now my relationship with everybody else. Well, I started. Yeah. <laughs> here's the thing. I started talking a lot about a lot more about death at dinner with my like sixth grader and eighth grader, and they did not like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they they. Uh, misunderstood me and they thought that I didn't love them because all I wanted to do was go home. My folks didn't believe me. My brother and sister, their jury was out still. And, um, some people thought I was crazy, of course, but the, but the thing about coming out in my town, I, I'd been here where I still live. Okay. I still live here. I don't work in the church yeah. anymore, but 
they had seen my behavior, not just in this embezzlement thing, mm -hmm. and all these different circumstances, domestic violence, working with the police department, going into dangerous yeah. situations, uh, you know, feeding the poor, housing the, the homeless, yeah. all this kind of other stuff. I felt safe coming out here because they knew me. And so this new bit of information, like when, when, um, when my brother came out as gay to my parents back way back when, my parents were yeah. aghast, you know, but really he's the same guy. Nothing really changed. He's yeah. the same person he was before you had that information. Um, that's kind of the way it was for me. Now you have this information. Now you understand why I behaved the way I behaved, but I'm still who you know. So, mostly what happened is I got recruited to television. I got, I, I got recruited yeah. out of the church and brought into the television. I started working in television and um, then had a larger audience for trying to uh, sell love and hope. Um, yeah. Not as a commodity, but as an experience. Tell somebody. Tell somebody you love and trust. Watch a lot of YouTube videos like this one on... Uh, near-death experience, you'll find out that you're not alone, and maybe talk to me. I've spent my entire life learning how to integrate. Integration is to, takes a decade, yeah. at least. It's not, it won't happen overnight. It takes work and effort, because you're now a different person. You're not the person you were before. So find other people like yourself and have conversations. And you might discover that there are people in your family and in your life who will reject you. But now you are who you are, and you can't change that. Uh, I'm at peterpanagore.love, peterpanagore.love, and it connects to my YouTube channel, my Instagram, my TikTok. Actually, I don't have the TikTok on there yet, but because uh, it's brand new, but don't, it's going fine. So peterpanagore.love, if you want to talk to me, book a time with me, I specialize in integration of mystical experiences, near-death experience, and otherwise spiritual, those spiritual oddities that you can't talk to anybody else about because they don't understand, yep. I do. And that's where I'm at. I'm available. I'm around. And I've got a, a international best-selling book, which you can find there, too.